Do you like pets? No, I mean, do you really like pets? Okay, seriously, I'm talking like, do you really, really like pets? Because if so, I think you're going to really enjoy today's video. Welcome to D4. Hey everybody, so here at D4, each week I take a deep dive into character builds for my favorite role-playing games. I like to crunch numbers about them, theorycraft about them, not so that I can tell you the right way or the best way to play a character, but to explore one potential way to build something with the hopes of creating a character that's both really fun, but also really powerful to play. So if you enjoy creating characters for your favorite role-playing games, almost as much as you enjoy playing the actual game itself, or if you're just looking for tips or ideas on how to build something that you are thinking about playing, then welcome home. This is where you belong, and I am so glad you're here. So thank you for watching. My name's Colby. I put uh, these videos out every Tuesday. So if you like what you see, I would appreciate it if you would consider joining the channel as a member. There's a little button down there that says join. If you click it, it'll tell you kind of what will happen if you decide to join as a member. You can get access to the library of write-ups that I create for each of these videos to help you recreate the character yourself a little more easily, as well as access to our Discord server and even uh, access to the monthly Q&A live hangout sessions that we do every month. So a huge thank you and shout out to my channel members. You guys are awesome. I could not do this without you. And to everybody else, you are awesome too. Thanks for just being here, watching, liking, subscribing, commenting, ringing the notifications bell. These are also great ways to help support the channel. If you don't want to be a member, that's okay. Thanks for just being here. Okay, so for many years now in D&D 5e, there has been some interesting language around summoned or created or companion creatures. Not all companions get this language, but a lot of them tell us that, quote, in combat, the creature shares your initiative count, but takes its turn immediately after yours. The only action it takes on its turn is the dodge action, unless you take a bonus action on your turn to command it to take another action. Then finally, if you are incapacitated, they can take any action of their choice, not just dodge. Now, that last bit, that's interesting. I mean, it's pretty nice, actually, in that even if you get stunned or knocked out so that you can't use your bonus action to command your pet to do something, they can still do something, right? And I think that's pretty much the intent of putting that verbiage in there. Now, early on in the channel, I did what I called the uh, Pokemon Trainer build. It was focused on getting as many companions as I could and then using them and only them to make attacks and do damage. It was a fun concept. It was kind of one of those artificial restriction on yourself builds just to kind of see what we could do with the idea, right? If we tried to stretch it to the max. And it was actually f a fairly effective character, I think. The problem that I very quickly ran into while I was building it though was that so many companions that different subclasses can get access to in the game required our bonus action to get them to do anything like I just read above, right? So I sort of had to choose the best bonus action pet available, then find others that didn't require a bonus action on our part in order to get them to do anything. Well, a while ago, I reread this verbiage, right? This bit about how the pet can do whatever it wants if we were incapacitated. And I thought, what if we could intentionally incapacitate ourselves? If we had a nice menagerie of pets, would it then free them up to run wild and kind of get rid of that bonus action logjam problem that we would otherwise have. I think it would, but what's the best way to incapacitate ourselves? A credit to YouTuber Schlomgar, an interesting username, by the way, <laughs> for giving me this little gem of an idea. Use the Feign Death spell. Because you see, Feign Death is this fun but super niche spell that you cast on a willing creature, it could include yourself, that puts them into a state indistinguishable from death. All outward inspection and even spells used to determine that creature's status then automatically makes others think that that creature is dead. And like another creature who didn't know otherwise doesn't even get to like make a check or a save to see if we're faking. So, you know, typically, I think you might want to use this spell to, like, pretend you're dead if your party is about to get wiped out so that at least one of you might be able to wake up later with relative safety so that you can bring your party back to life and escape a total TPK situation, right? Uh, there are other potential uses for it, I guess. Maybe to get the jump on some enemies if you know they're going to be passing through or something. I actually would love to hear in the comments if you've got a great feign death story. I'm sure there are some good ones out there. But anyways, yeah, super niche, right? The thing is, when we're feigning death in this way, we're resistant to all damage but psychic, uh, we're blinded, 
and then yes, importantly, we are incapacitated. So what if we gathered as many pets and companions as we possibly could and then just cast feign death on ourselves. We'd be incapacitated and then all of our companions could just do whatever they, or we, I suppose, wanted them to without being restricted because of our lack of bonus action. That sounds freaking awesome. <laughs> and maybe hilarious. And you know, maybe a terrible idea, but don't you wanna at least find out if it would be any good? Just for kicks? I know I do. So let's try and build it. I proudly present D&D build number 159, the Menagerie, playing Possum, the Sleepy Shepherd, the Narcomancer, <laughs> the Yamcha, the Deadbeat. <laughs> Big thanks to the Discord people for all of the suggestions, but I think I'm gonna go with Drop Dead Fred for this one. Kudos to uh, Derek from the Discord channel for the prompt. Also, big shout out to my good friend Randall Hampton for the fantastic artwork that he created for this build. I really love this one. It captures the idea perfectly. He's a fantastic artist. If you would be interested in following him to see the other stuff that he's done or to potentially commission him to see if he can create some art for your character or maybe even your entire party, I will put links in the video description as always on how to do so. And before we jump into the build, I am super excited to talk to you guys about the sponsor for the video this week, Homebrewed Games. So raise your hand if you were around for my very first ever video that had a sponsor back in June of 2021, Homebrewed Games sponsored my uh, Wolf and the Coyote video, actually, where I talked about their book, Druid's Secrets of the Primal Circle, which I actually have here. Hold on. Yeah, still got the book. It's awesome. I love it. it. has all kinds of amazing, fantastic things that are mostly druid focused, but there's some other stuff in here as well. It's a great like homebrew 5e compendium resource. Well, Homebrewed Games has recently launched a brand new Patreon site that's dedicated to you guessed it, providing DMs and players alike a ton of really fantastic homebrew content to augment their favorite TTRPG. Sign up on their Patreon and unlock a treasure trove of goodness, including, but not limited to, stuff from the books they've already put out, like Druid, Secrets of the Primal Circle, as well as books that are currently in the works, like Guardians of Secret and Shadow, which is due out later this year. But there is more than just the new races, backgrounds, classes, subclasses, spells, magic items, monsters, and lore from the books, which patrons can get free PDF copies of by supporting homebrewed games on their Patreon site, but you can also get access to other like standalone stuff that they're working on, my favorite of which are new factions. These factions are ready to plug into your existing campaign setting. So think of like the Harpers or the Emerald Enclave in Faerun, right? But not necessarily tied to Faerun, though they could be if you wanted them to. These new factions that they've homebrewed come with like player options as well. So the Dragon Banners, for example, who have a variety of subclasses available for a bunch of different classes that gain dragon-like powers as they pledge their loyalty to an elder dragon. Or the Keepers of the Dead, a ready-made faction that also includes a new cleric subclass that uses the power of undeath to hunt down and redeem read kill the undead. Although hauntingly in the process, this subclass becomes undead themselves. So cool. So you guys, speaking from experience, the quality of stuff that Homebrewed Games puts out is really high. And what might be my favorite thing of all the stuff that they do is they put a lot of thought into building it, not just from a mechanics perspective, but from a lore perspective too. And the great thing about switching from Kickstarter, which they've used for previous projects, to Patreon, is that it allows them to be super responsive to their supporters, answering questions, receiving feedback, and even improving and updating their content based on feedback and, oh, I don't know, upcoming D&D rules changes so that the book you bought from them never becomes obsolete. So if you like homebrewed content, do yourself a favor and go become a patron for homebrewed games. Check them out by going to uh, patreon.com slash D&D homebrew. For a few bucks a month, you can get access to content that's really going to augment your game for everyone at your table. Huge thanks to homebrewed games. Love you guys. And let's jump into the build. Now, before I get started, I need to say a few words or a few more words in addition to the few words that I've already said. First up, this build is obviously a little crazy. It's super high on concept and maybe a little lower on like 
pure mechanical optimization, right? One of my fun, weird, high concept, artificially restricting ourselves builds akin to like the dive bomber or the thorn lock, etc. Right? I'm going to compare them to other sustained damage dealers that I've built to date for fun, but I think they would probably be more of a support character than anything, especially for like the first eight or even nine levels, and even beyond that, honestly. Thus, they might work better in like a mid or higher level one shot, or at the very least in a campaign where you're starting off in tier two or tier three play. Also, we are going to be all over the place with multi-classing, and I don't think I would necessarily try to justify why we're taking levels in this class now and that class later and a third and even fourth class eventually. You might have a great character story that can tie it all together, but if it were me, I think I'd just say, listen, this character is like a custom class that I've created. I'm calling them a tinkerer or a zookeeper or a collector, etc. And in order to embody the vision that I have for them, it's going to require a number of levels in a bunch of different classes. Okay, DM. So yes, as always, talk this character over with your DM to make sure they're on board with all of the craziness that you're about to bring and see if they might have some ideas on how to help you improve it and or fully realize your character in their world. Sound good? Okay. At level one then, for our starting class, we are going to start off as an artificer. Now, my original plan was to start with a different class, one that, uh, well, could get the Fain death spell since that was supposedly the thing we're going to be building around for this character, right? But here's the thing. Of all the classes that Fain Death is available to, the Bard and the Druid are the only ones who can get a pet with the verbiage we're looking for. They require a bonus action to do anything unless we're incapacitated, right? And since Fain Death is a third level spell, it would mean at least five levels in either of those classes to get it. Meaning that by the time we got to our first damage report at level six, we're only going to have one companion if we start a Druid or Bard. And if we only have one companion, there's no need to even Fain Death in the first place, right? Because we can just use our bonus action to command that pet. No not only that, but if we're actually playing this character starting out at level one, going bard or druid first was going to leave some really big weaknesses in the build that will become obvious as we go, especially our armor class and our concentration check. And since I wanted some artificer levels eventually anyways on this character, starting as an artificer just ended up making the most sense so that we could have constitution saving throw proficiency as an artificer one, as well as medium armor and shield proficiency. I also happen to think that the character story and concept and arc progresses most smoothly if we start as an artificer. So yes, when we first meet our champion, they are something of a tinkerer. One thing is for certain, however, they are not a very typical tinkerer. At first, perhaps they're mostly creating clockwork toys and gadgets with their hands, but as their skill and study increases, they begin to learn ways of tapping into the powers of the multiverse to further breathe life into their creations, as they travel the world looking for new companions to add to their collection. Your passion is to will into existence, whether with your hands or with your charm, your performative arts, or later by drawing upon arcane and primal magics, autonomous beings beings who you can care for, nurture, and who in turn will fight for and defend you, their caretaker. Which is great, since I think you're probably something of a coward yourself. Very intelligent, very charismatic, even pretty wise, but very much lacking in the physical attributes and bravery departments, I would say. As for our race, there are really only two options. We're gonna be about as mad as any build I've ever done here, a multiple ability score dependent. And if we're going to make this character work all the way to level 17, like I've laid out anyways, we're gonna need a lot of stat increases. This means that we've got to either go half elf, since they get a plus two to one ability and then two plus ones to two others, right? Or a mountain dwarf, since they uniquely get two plus twos. Mountain Dwarf kind of feels better to me for someone interested in like creating things with their hands. And if I weren't starting Artificer, I'd definitely go that route for the medium armor proficiency that dwarves innately get. But I think I might prefer half elf mechanically here, just ever so slightly, since they have a better move speed and get some nice benefits, like maybe some additional spells or even more move speed, etc., depending on which sub race of half elf you pick, right? I'm going to assume that we're going to go drow half elf here so that we could get some nice once per day castings of fairy fire and darkness, but feel free to take a different sub race if you prefer. Or, yeah, sure, go mountain dwarf. 
they're a great option here. As for our ability scores, I am assuming that we're going the point by method as always, and assuming that we went half elf, we're gonna wanna go with a 14 charisma plus two there, a 15 intelligence plus one there, so we got a 16 in both of those, and then a 14 wisdom and a 12 dexterity with our final plus one there to get us to 13 dex. Meaning, yes, you've got to dump constitution. <laughs> Say what? Are you crazy? Yeah. A little bit. I kind of am. But here's the thing. Once we're feigning death, we're not really going to care about our own survivability, right? The only problem is, like I've said, feign death is a third level spell, meaning we're not going to be getting it until we have five levels in for us, bard or druid, meaning we've got to endure several levels of some serious fragility. This is why I said earlier that the character might work better if you are starting out at tier 2 or tier 3 play, right? But also, let me say this. If you're planning on playing this character right from level 1, and you're only going to go up to like level 10 or so, like most campaigns, right? Then you're not actually going to need dexterity or wisdom all that high, so feel free to go mountain dwarf, start with a 15 in both charisma and intelligence, take a plus 2 in each so that we could get both of them to an 18 with our first ability score increase, and then you could get a 14 constitution if you wanted, or maybe even a 14 dex for armor class purposes and at least a 10 constitution. It's still not great, but better than an 8 con and a 13 dex, right? Right. So, as for equipment, I'm going to say let's go the gold buy route, grab some scale mail and a shield, and maybe a healing potion or two if you can afford them, bump some money off your friends because you are going to need them. <laughs> as an artificer one, we get magical tinkering, which lets us infuse a non-magical mundane item to make it emit a sound or light or a message or even a smell, That's some fun little utility there. And then we get artificer spells, right? Now, like I kind of said at the beginning, I'm going to kind of emphasize this point here this character is primarily a support character. There's just no two ways about it. Even when we can get a bunch of pets going and we're feigning death, we're never going to be doing crazy damage. But we will have a lot of potential for decent healing, buffing, debuffing, controlling. So for spells, focus on those things. Cure wounds for some healing if our team needs it in a pinch. Fairy fire to potentially debuff enemies in a 20-foot area to cause all attacks against them to be made with advantage right at the cost of our concentration and sure grab firebolt for a damaging cantrip for now as well as a booming or green flame blade for use later at level two we get infuse item uh, which is my favorite artificer feature it lets us enhance some non-magical items and make them magical we can learn four infusions from a really great list of options but can only use two at any one time no one item can hold more than one infusion and we can't use any infusion on more than one item for now let's plan on using enhanced arcane focus to give our spell hit chance a plus one as well as mind sharpener that lets us just automatically succeed at a failed concentration check up to four times per day that will definitely come in handy it makes me feel a lot better about our ability to hold on to our concentration going forward despite our supposedly anyways if you're planning on taking this build all the way to 17 terrible constitution I'd also grab enhanced weapon uh, which will give our weapons a plus one to hit and damage which I will want to start using next level as for our fourth infusion to learn, it's actually the most important for this build, and our first little pet companion, though not one that we'll really plan on using for a while, the homunculus servant. This cute tiny little construct functions similarly to all of the companions that we'll be getting on this build like i discussed in the preamble it can do stuff if we use a bonus action to command it but otherwise it just takes the dodge action unless we're incapacitated as far as what it can do uh, not a lot <laughs> it's pretty squishy though it does have dark vision and can fly and has evasion making it a lot better at not just getting blown up by a fireball than other pets and familiars might be uh, like a familiar it can use its reaction to deliver a spell that we cast with a range of touch and then yes can make an attack for 1d4 plus proficiency bonus in damage not a lot but we will potentially make use of them eventually at level three we get the right tool for the job it's pretty much a ribbon feature letting us magically create some tools if we need them but what we are excited about at this level is our artificer specialist our subclass right because we are taking yes 
Battlesmith. Battlesmith gives us a bunch of really fantastic features. First of all, we get additional spells, shield first and foremost, so that now our AC is actually somewhat respectable so long as we've got a spell slot and our reaction to use it. The other freebie, uh, Heroism, is a nice little buff that grants temporary hit points to an ally or yourself at the beginning of every turn. Unfortunately, it requires our concentration, so we probably won't be using it that much. Better yet, though, as an artificer, we get battle ready, which tells us that we get proficiency with martial weapons, and when we attack with a magical weapon, we can use our intelligence to hit and damage instead of our strength or dexterity. So at this point, let's grab our favorite D8 one-handed weapon. A Warhammer feels appropriate for this character, I think. Swap out our infusion from enhanced arcane focus to enhanced weapon, making the Warhammer or whatever a magical plus one weapon, meaning that on our turn with our action, if and when we want to, we can make a weapon attack using our intelligence modifier of plus three, plus one more for the weapon. And in fact, we might as well cast Booming Blade or Green Flame Blade here instead of making a weapon attack, right? We don't have extra attack. We're not actually going to get to it on this character. So we can get the little bonus that those blade spells provide, right? As well as a little extra damage when we hit character level five. It's not going to be amazing damage, but for a support and control focused character like we're going to be, it's not bad when we need a little extra damage. Most important of all for this build, of course, though, is that we get our Steel Defender. Now, this is a great little pet it's going to be our go-to bonus action pet attack for the next several levels. The Steel Defender is a lot tankier than the Homunculus, though not super tanky or durable or anything. Though I did do a build where I tried to make the pet the tank uh, way back when, and that was fun and actually worked fairly well, I think, if you build around it, right? But the Defender can't be surprised. Uh, they've got some decent immunities, and again, like every pet we'll be getting, it just takes the dodge action unless we use our bonus action to have it do something else, or we're incapacitated. That something else will most often be a force-empowered rend attack, which uses our spell attack modifier to hit, though it simply does a d8 plus our proficiency bonus in damage. Again, not a lot, but it's not nothing. They also have a nice little self-heal that they can use three times per day, and a cool deflect attack reaction that I really tried to make use of in that Battlesmith tank build, right? This lets the Steel Defender impose disadvantage on an enemy's attack if they attack anyone else but it, right? Only on a single attack, unfortunately, uh, and it requires their reaction to use. So it's a little like one attack soft taunt, as it were. This can definitely help our allies stay just a little bit safer, or us for that matter. For now, yeah, I probably would keep the Steel Defender close to ourselves. We're probably the squishiest party member. Though, I don't know, medium armor, a shield, the shield spell, maybe not. Anyways, we can revive the Steel Defender with a first level spell slot, heal it with the Mending Cantrip, and yeah, they're just a good little metal doggy. She's a good dog. <laughs> But at level four, with two pets now under our belt and some nice defensive features as well, it's time to begin our foray into multi-classing and pick up my favorite thing about this build. Our little tinkerer collector has been truly expanding their capabilities and knowledge around the aspects of creation. And at this point in their career are taking the bit of our cane that their artificer roots have given them and like expanding that capacity to more fully tap into the powers of creation themselves. Helps. Whatever your reasons, we are going to take bard levels now. And yes, we're actually going to be more bard than anything on this character, which I love, as I think they're the best embodiment of like a wandering collector jack of all trades that I envision this character to be. Anyways, at bard one, then we get bardic inspiration, letting us use a bonus action to inspire our allies so that they can add our inspiration die, a d6 for now, to their next attack roll, saving throw, or ability check. Always handy. Ever useful. As for bard spells that we get here, I'd be sure to pick up Vicious Mockery, letting us potentially do a little damage and debuff an enemy with an insult. Healing Word for some bonus action, healing from range. Silvery Barbs is always good, of course, to help ensure an enemy's failure and an ally's success, so long as we can keep the Silvery Barbs mob at bay. Ah! 
and then probably Bane for a nice debuff or Hideous Laughter for some strong single target control here early on. Both of those require concentration, so we'll have to decide between them and Fairy Fire, but fortunately, since we started Artificer, I'm less worried about holding on to that concentration than I otherwise would have been, despite our crap constitution. At level 5, we would be a Bard 2, and that means we get Jack of All Trades. This lets us add half of our proficiency bonus to any ability check that we're not already adding our proficiency bonus to, always handy, and then Song of Rest, which lets us add a d6 in healing during a short rest to anyone in our party who's spending hit dice to heal as we regale them with music or perhaps a restful, soothing story. A book? That's right. When I was your age, television was called books. And this is a special book. At level 6, we are a Bard 3, and that means we get our Bard College, our Bard subclass. And are you ready? Are you excited? I am, because we are going with College of Creation, of course, in case you hadn't guessed it. And I think this is the first time I've ever used this subclass in a build before. Part of me wants to say I used it in like a Dungeon Dudes inspired build a while ago or something, but if so, I can't remember which one it was. One day I'm going to finish that table of contents that I'm working on for all of my builds that breaks things down by class and subclass, so I don't have to keep going, have I done this before? <laughs> Anyways, this Bard subclass is so cool. So cool. Let's actually read what Wizards has to say about them. Bards believe the cosmos is a work of art, the creation of the first dragons and gods. That creative work included harmonies that continue to resound through existence today, a power known as the Song of Creation. The bards of the College of Creation draw on that primeval song through dance, music, and poetry. And their teachers share this lesson. Before the sun and the moon, there was the song and its music awoke the first dawn. Its melodies so delighted the stones and trees that some of them gained a voice of their own. And now they sing too. Learn the song, students, and you too can teach the mountains to sing and dance. Mwah, that is gorgeous, perfect. So yes, I love this subclass. First of all, because of Moat of Potential, which might give the best bardic inspiration buff to any subclass. Because with Moat of Potential, when we give an ally inspiration, it makes our inspiration more powerful in a number of ways. If the ally uses it for an ability check, they get to roll the inspiration die twice and choose which roll to use, kind of like having advantage on the bardic inspiration roll. If they use it on a saving throw, it gives temporary hit points equal to both the roll and our charisma modifier, very nice. And if they use it on an attack roll, the target and each creature of our choice within five feet have to make a constitution saving throw or take thunder damage equal to the number rolled. So awesome so flavorful. The ribbon feature for creation bards here is performance of creation, which actually is one of the best like ribbon features of any subclass in game and is probably too good to call a ribbon feature. It tells us that once per day, or with a second level or higher spell slot, as an action, we can create one non-magical item within 10 feet of us. Doesn't require concentration. The gold value of the item can't be more than 20 times our bard level, so 60 gold at the moment. It must be medium sized or smaller, though that will increase with bard levels, going to large at bard 6, and that it disappears after a number of hours equal to our proficiency bonus plenty long enough to be really useful. Now, it has to be created on a surface that can support it, so no like summoning an anvil 10 feet above an enemy and letting it drop on them for some Looney Tunes falling damage, right? And the space has to be unoccupied. That's potentially the biggest sticking point. So yeah, please let me know your favorite ways that you've seen this used in game. Create something and then sell it to an unsuspecting merchant? Hope you're leaving town right afterwards and never coming back. I mean, the most obvious one to me would be to create like a metal door to block a narrow hallway, or maybe the door wouldn't necessarily be attached to the wall, so just like a big block of stone or something. Better yet, like a steel cage around an enemy, though that might not work if we consider the cage and the creature to be occupying the same space, right? It could arguably work right now on a small enemy, I think, at the moment, and then maybe a medium enemy once we get to level six and the thing we create can become large. Maybe, maybe not. 
probably not. <laughs> so of course, talk this over with your DM early on to make sure that you're not gonna be slowing down combat with a big debate if you're trying to do something with this that your DM is not comfortable with, right? But yeah, have fun with it. And please let me know in the comments how you like to use this ability. As for the second level spells that we get here, nothing that we'd plan on using to bolster the damage of our menagerie making selves. In fact, we're still not that much of a menagerie maker yet, it's more of a menagerie maker in training. So keep focusing on those support things like aid to heal and bolster the maximum hit points of several party members. You could even potentially use this on your pets, though it might make your friends a little annoyed. I mean, you could cast it twice, right? Lesser restoration for a little cure-all of some nasty conditions. A hold person is a fantastic way to paralyze a humanoid. Cloud of daggers can be a decent damage dealer if you've got a way to hold an enemy in place, or even better, companions that can move enemies into place, right? Let me add, though, that I mean, thanks to our performance of creation, it might be a smidge easier to use Cloud of Daggers to devastating effect if we can, like, trap enemies behind a big block of stone and then put Cloud of Daggers behind it, or maybe, you know, if the passageway is two squares wide, well, put a block of stone on one of them and Cloud of Daggers on the other. At the very least, they gotta pass through the Cloud of Daggers in order to get to you. I mean, that would require two actions to set up, so situationally useful at best, but be on the lookout for an opportunity to take advantage of that combo, I think. Bards also get expertise at this level, letting us pick two skills that we're proficient in and doubling our proficiency bonus for them, which is wonderful for utility. I'd take perception and something else. Pick your favorite here. Uh, maybe performance, since we're a bard, or maybe persuasion if we want to be a party face, which we absolutely could be on this build, so keep that in mind. It's another thing that you really can bring with you in addition to like the support and the control that you'll potentially be able to provide, right? Anyways, your call, PYF. Okay, at level six, it is time for our first damage report. Even though this is basically just a support class, but if we are comparing ourselves to other sustained damage dealers, then I guess we gotta say, let's use our bonus action for an attack from our steel defender, and our action for a booming blade or green flame blade attack with our enhanced d8 weapon, since both of those blade cantrips do an extra d8 of damage now, right, since 5th level. Still not gonna be a ton of damage. Like I say, we're basically support. I'm going to say that a million times in this video, just keep it in mind. Let's pretend, just for fun, that we've also got fairy fire on our target so that we and our defender and the rest of our allies, for that matter, have advantage on attacks against our target. Thus, against enemies with a 10 armor class here, we would on average do 22 DPR, and against enemies with a 15 AC, it would be 19 damage per round. And again, while that's not a ton of damage, it's actually way better than we would have been if we would have just started Bard here and beelined for feign death, as was my original plan. Compared to other sustained damage dealing characters that I've built to date, at this level, though, we are still dead last. <laughs> but only barely, so yeah, like I've been saying all along, temper your expectations, you are a support character, and hey, great news, this character is pretty great support. You're buffing, debuffing, healing, controlling, even taunting your enemies, potentially, you will be a really effective character, you really will. And for a support character, you're doing pretty decent damage. Okay. Our expectations in the right place? Probably not, but that's okay. Very soon, we actually will be able to start playing with, like, the character in the way that I said that we were going to be building them, right, uh, at the beginning of the video. So, hang tight. At level 7, we would be a bard 4, and that means we get our first ability score increase or feat. I think we ought to bump charisma here, but it's not a no-brainer. Bumping intelligence would actually improve our damage more at the moment, but bards benefit more from charisma, right? Our spells, our eventual companion that we're going to get from bard levels, but more importantly, perhaps, the number of inspirations that we can use per rest, and even our out-of-combat utility, especially if you're wanting to be a bit of a party face on this character, bump charisma. That's what I'm going to assume we're doing anyways. At level 8, we would be a bard 5, and bard 5 is like my favorite bard level. Our inspiration die goes to a d8, uh, better yet, font of inspiration that we get here causes those inspirations to reset on a short rest now, so nice. And we get third level spells, which means yes, of course we can now get fear and hypnotic pattern and slow, but then there's fantastic utility and support stuff like dispel magic, catnap, and tiny hut. But the most important one for us, for this build, is yes, Feign death, which we can finally get now. now. Here's the thing. 
there's not really a great reason to use Feign Death at the moment. We only have two pets, and both of them actually do less damage than if we just stayed on our feet and used Booming Blade with our action, right? Not to mention the benefits of concentrating on a spell, of course. Also, maybe let me insert just a mini rant here. I'm really perplexed that Feign Death is a third level spell. For this build, it meant taking five levels in either Bard or Druid. It is available to Clerics, Wizards, and Undying Warlocks as well, but they didn't really have good companions for the purposes of the build. And that was a pretty steep investment just to get this spell that doesn't do much other than tricks enemies into thinking you're dead. I don't know. Is it better than I'm thinking? I wonder what the reasoning was uh, over at Wizards of the Coast when they decided that this was so powerful that it needed to be a third level spell. Anyways, right, we've got the spell now, which means that in a pinch, if we really needed to, we could start using it. At level nine, though, we would be a bard six. As a creation bard, we get animating performance, which is just so freaking good. Let's break it down. This feature tells us that once per day, or again with a third level spell slot or higher, we can use an action to animate an inanimate object that is large or smaller and bring it to life, basically. Now, this object can't be worn or carried when we animate it, and it can't be magical, but it then becomes a dancing item that has its own dancing item stat block, right? This is a really strong pet, the strongest that we're gonna be getting on this build, and one of the main reasons why I wanted to prioritize Bard and Charisma over Druid and Wisdom. Like everything in our menagerie with this build, you can command it to do something with your bonus action, unless you're incapacitated, then it can do whatever it wants. One really cool thing here, we're told that when we use our bonus action to give out Bardic Inspiration, we can command the dancing item as part of that same bonus action. Awesome. The item is relatively tanky, it has some nice immunities, hits decently hard for a pet, it's a d10 with a proficiency bonus rider, with a hit chance based on our spellcasting modifier as always, hence the desire to increase our charisma. It can increase or decrease the move speed of any creature who starts their turn within 10 feet of it. It's a nice little snare or buff, and even has a 30 foot fly speed. Incredible. Now. You're going to want to talk to your DM about what this fly speed in particular might mean for you and your friends. Can you stand or sit on this animated object and have it carry you and fly and give you flight, right? Probably, I think most DMs would say yes, but it's not technically considered a mount and we're not really told like how much weight it might be able to lift into the air or anything. You know, can your whole party pile on the thing that you've animated here? Yeah, maybe, but that might be a little less likely than just letting you take a ride. I don't know. If it works, concentration free flight. Though it doesn't get to take its turn until after yours, so it's not like a controlled mount or anything, right? Again, unless your DM decides to just let it function as one. For our purposes, I'm mostly interested in the damage that it does, though you could definitely argue that the damage it does is the least interesting or powerful thing about it, right? We also get counter charm at this level, which is not so freaking good. <laughs> it lets us use our action to give our party advantage on saves against being frightened or charmed. Use it probably never. <laughs> okay, so at level nine, is it time to finally test our little gimmick here? We've got three pets and feign death. What do we do about it? First of all, I should mention the good news is that our two artificer pets just kind of last until they die. The dancing item only lasts an hour, meaning that you might have to get it going on round one before you drop dead if you decide to do so. But anyways, if we wanted to play with our little gimmicky tactic, it's pretty simple. Once you've got all three companions in play, you cast feign death on yourself and then just let them make their attacks and their reactions. You'd get a d4 plus 4 from your homunculus, a d8 plus 4 from your steel defender, and a d10 plus 4 from your dancing item. Sweet. Hang on a minute. You might be saying in a really bad cockney accent. <laughs> Is that really more damage than, say, just making a booming blade attack with our infused weapon and then maybe like a bonus action attack with our dancing item? Especially if that means we would still be able to concentrate on like fairy fire so that we've got advantage? Or more astutely, hypnotic pattern or fear or my favorite, slow? To you, bad cockney accent guy, I would reply, uh, no, actually, <laughs> this feign death shtick is not as good a damage. <laughs> 
Welcome to the world of thought experiments. I don't think it means that the build is worthless though, not by a long shot. How you'd actually want to play it out in game, I think, is simply to have your artificer companions up and active, but not actually be commanding them to do anything for the most part. Instead, just concentrate on your favorite spell, make your booming blade attacks and your dancing item attacks and inspire and heal your allies when you need to. Your defender and your homunculus will just happily take the dodge action and likely stay safe. And and, I mean, hey, if the enemy is taking their actions and resources to try and kill your pets, that's a big win for our team, so good job. Uh, not a huge win for the pets themselves, but they're generally easy to bring back to life, so hopefully they'll forgive us. But then, yeah, when things start to look dicey, maybe you're getting low on health, maybe you've lost concentration, you're almost out of spell slots, then you pull that break glass in case of emergency tactic, feign death, and let all of your companions go wild. With any luck, they will be able to finish off the fight in your behalf, or at least distract the enemy long enough to allow your companions to make an escape. We get some great mileage out of both our artificer and bard levels here, regardless of how effective it is to let our pets attack instead of us. And yeah, I enjoy having a fun backup plan when I need it. But no, for now, for the damage report, let's assume that we're still making a booming blade attack and then inspiring our allies while having our dancing item smash stuff. It can snare enemies, it can speed up allies, it can fly. Our steel defender is debuffing enemies on an attack that they make so that they have disadvantage. I'm concentrating on slow, I think, here over fairy fire. Sure, technically, advantage from fairy fire would be better damage. It would look better on the spreadsheet than, you know, lowering an enemy's AC by two with slow, but slow is so vastly a superior spell. It's a crazy strong debuff that you'll likely be able to hit more targets with without risking hitting your allies too. It does a lot more than just make them easier to hit, though it does that too, so it will bump our damage slightly. Anyways. At this level here, with these tactics, yeah, versus a 10 armor class, we would be doing 22 damage per round, and against a 16 armor class, it would be 18 DPR. And yeah, that's pretty much the same since our last check. <laughs> <laughs> because even though we've had some very minor damage bumps, advantage from fairy fire looks better on paper than a minus two AC from slow, but only by a couple of points. My integrity just will not allow me to assume that I'm using fairy fire here. Because regardless, our damage sucks. <laughs> That's not really the point of the build. The point of the build is to be an awesome support with lots of great useful pets, and we are accomplishing that no question. So let's add to our little menagerie collection, shall we? Because at level 10, now that we've got Fain Death and our Bardic Pet, and we've got our best Bard spells with our inspirations resetting on a short rest, it's time to get some Ranger levels. You've been waiting for this, I'm sure. So we would be a Ranger 1, and this means we get Deft Explorer Canny, which essentially gives us another skill to get expertise in. Always welcome. Go ahead and pick your favorite here. And then we get Favored Foe, which lets us add a d4 of damage to an attack that we make once on a turn at the cost of our concentration. Not really worth it in all, but the rarest of circumstances, I think. At level 11, we would be a ranger 2, and that means we get ranger spells. I'm gonna say pick your favorites, PYF, maybe outside of Goodberry, which is both an efficient heal, healing for 10 flat damage if someone were to take an action to eat all of those berries, right? As well as a nice utility spell, keeping your party from ever needing to worry about rations, again, for those of you who track that kind of thing. We do get a ranger fighting style here also i think i'd probably go defense here bolstering our rather subpar survivability thank goodness for that shield spell to be slightly less subpar we'd have what a 19 armor class without uh, any magic armor with lots of spell slots for the shield spell all right that's actually not all that bad pay no attention to our hit point pool it's totally fine <laughs> At level 12, we would be a Ranger 3, and that means we get Primal Awareness, which basically at this level just lets us learn the Speak with Animals spell for free and be able to cast it once per day for free without spending a spell slot. Some decent little utility there. But then, most importantly, we get our Ranger archetype, our Ranger subclass, and we are gonna go with, what do you think, Beastmaster or Drake Warden? Beastmaster or Drake Warden? I'm taking the dragon. Of course I am. <laughs> okay, the reality is, you could go either route here, and they would be very similar. The main reason that I'm taking Drake Warden here is, well, yeah, because I love dragons, but more than that, we just didn't have the points to bump up our wisdom very high, and the 
Beastmaster's companion, their hit chance is based on our wisdom modifier, the one we got from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, that is the good one, right? Not the player's handbook version, that sucks. Uh, whereas the Drake Warden's pet just gets a flat bonus to hit based on our proficiency bonus. So it's just gonna hit a little more reliably. So yes, as a Drake Warden, first up we get the ribbon feature Draconic Gift, which gives us the Thaumaturgy cantrip and lets us know the Draconic language or another language of our choice, which feels a little weird, but okay. More importantly, of course, we get our Drake Companion. The Drake just lasts until we die or we spend a first level spell slot to summon it. So again, like if things are going well, the enemies are attacking our pets here, right? They're a little expendable as much as we love them. Like everything, it just dodges until we use our bonus action to command it, unless we're incapacitated. It has a bite attack that does a d6 plus proficiency bonus in damage, but then it's both immune to an elemental damage type. We choose this when we summon them, and so could change it up, that's cool. And it deals 1d6 of that damage type as a reaction on its turn anytime a creature within 30 feet of it that it can see hits a target with a weapon attack. I really like that. It's sort of guaranteed damage, or nearly so, because surely someone in your party is going to hit something at least once per round, right? I'm just going to assume that we're getting that d6. It's not a ton, but every little bit helps. And best of all, just like the Steel Defender with a neat little reaction option, the Companion can use it even if they're just taking the dodge action on their turn because we're using our bonus action to command a different Companion, right? And we haven't incapacitated ourselves. They can still use their reactions. At level 13, I've got one more pet on the list, but I'm dying for another ability score increase. So let's go Ranger 4. That would give us an ability score increase or feat, and I'm gonna say, well, again, like, it's still not an easy call. I think I'd still go with Charisma since we're still mostly a bard, and our best spells are definitely bard spells. Our best pet is a bard pet, and we could always use more inspiration. So yeah, let's cap that Charisma at 20. All right, time for our level 13 damage report. Since last check, we have added another pet to the mix, potentially, plus increased our charisma. We've also done a lot of other things to increase our versatility, our utility, our support, our defensive capabilities even. But yeah, those two little bumps are pretty much it damage-wise. I suppose the better question here might be, are we better off now, damage-wise, feigning death on ourselves right at the beginning of the fight? Booming Blade got a 1d8 bump at level 11. I mean, the answer to that question is, yeah, in a lab? On paper? Sure. Barely. At an actual tabletop gaming session? Gaining three pet attacks at the cost of giving up your ability to concentrate on a spell and continue to inspire your allies while still making a booming blade attack yourself if you wanted? Yeah, of course not, right? But just for fun, let's see what our damage would be like now if we ran into a fight with our four companions and just drop dead, letting them all make attacks each round. We get a d4 plus 5 from our homunculus, a d6 plus 5 from our drake, a d8 plus 5 from our steel defender, and a d10 plus 5 from our dancing item. Plus 1d6 more damage thanks to our drake's reaction, right? And yeah, against enemies with a 10 armor class here, we do 39 damage per round. And against a 17 AC, it would be 27. DPR. Wee wee. That's like a 50% increase since last check. <laughs> it's pets flying everywhere. Just tearing stuff apart. Yeah, of course, we're still bringing up the rear compared to other sustained damage builds that I've done to date, and we are still a support and control focused character, not a damage dealer. And we're having a blast. All right. At level 14, it's time to pick up one final pet, and that is gonna mean druid levels. So, we'd be a druid one, we get druidic, that's like the special language that druids have that they can use to sort of leave signs for each other in the wild, and then we get druid spells, I'm just gonna say PYF here, pick your favorites, nothing we need here that we didn't already have, honestly, so look for those like out of combat niche utility things, right? At level 15, we would be a druid two, and that means we get wild shape so that we can transform into a beast of one quarter challenge rating or lower, which is great and fun and often very useful, but I'm not gonna go into it too much because we also get our druid circle here, our druid subclass, and we, of course, are gonna go wildfire, which means we're gonna have another use for that wild shape because wildfire druids, among other things, get 
summon wildfire spirit, which will be our fifth and final companion. The spirit is actually really great. We burn a use of our wild shape to summon it, and it can both make a ranged flame seed attack, but better yet, it can run up next to an ally, or multiple allies, and teleport them all 15 feet away, doing a little AoE of fire damage to those left behind within five feet, right? Barring a dexterity saving throw. Some nice utility here to help get allies out of harm's way, especially if they're like grappled or on death's door or heck, even like behind a wall of force or something, right? Or in a cage. There's no restriction given on getting them out from behind something that they're like stuck behind. They just have to be within five feet of the spirit when it teleports. We probably should have gotten this one a little bit sooner. <laughs> it's a lot of potential fun and utility here. But at level 16, you know, I think if I were going to level 20 on this character, I'd probably go back to Bard here so I could get to Bard 10 and thus magical secrets. Maybe I grab Find Greater Steed. Or maybe we go back to Ranger since the Drake Warden pet actually scales at Ranger level 7, letting it become a mount and do a little more damage. But since we're about to be done with the build, let's just grab another level of Artificer here so that we can get another ability score increase or feat. And I think I probably bumped my intelligence here to 18 since two of our pets benefit from intelligence, right? Not to mention our weapon attacks, if we're making them. And then at level 17, sure, let's go bard seven so that we can at least get to fourth level bard spells. You know, that would give us access to dimension door, freedom of movement, greater invisibility, locate creature, psychic lance I really like, polymorph, uh, and many, many more, but not planning on necessarily using any of them in combat for like a damage report, so go ahead and PYF, pick your favorite. All right. At level 17, it's time for our final damage report. Since last check, we have added a fifth and final pet in the Wildfire Spirit, which I'm assuming is just going to be bamfing people away all the time and doing a little area of effect damage when they do so. And we've also bumped our intelligence and picked up even more utility and support capabilities. But against enemies with a 10 armor class here, we would on average do 52 damage per round, and against an 18 AC, it would be 36 DPR. Which, you know what? is not last place at this level when compared to other DPR builds that I've done to date. They are solidly in second to last place, just ahead of the shield master, so there. And that's on a character who, again, is basically just a support character, right? Admittedly, the shield master was more of a controller and a tank than anything, but let's break this all down here with some final thoughts. The tier score for this character, if you take the damage that they do at each enemy armor class, at each of the four damage reports that we report on, and just average it all into one big number, we end up with a 23, which yes, is going to put them significantly lower than any other DPR build that I've ever done. So the question is, is this a failed experiment? I suppose that all depends on what you're wanting out of the build. If you're looking for an amazing damage dealer who can stay safe themselves by feigning death, right? Then yeah, this isn't really the build for you. If you're looking for a fun, potentially funny, solid support character with lots of flavor, who has a nice break glass in case of emergency, unleash the menagerie backup plan when things go south, then this is a fantastic build. The damage that it does, that it is capable of doing, is going to surpass, I think, most if not all of the just like support builds that I've done in the past. Those that are focused on like just healing, right? Or just controlling, etc. So that's something. One question some might be asking is, why does this build do so much less damage than my other pet focused build, the Pokemon Trainer? That build was an upper tier two build for sustained damage per round with a tier score of 58, more than double where we ended up, right? The main reasons I think are these. First, the Pokemon Trainer, didn't focus on trying to get feigned death, letting us get more companions more quickly, including, most importantly actually, the summon beast companion from a spell that requires concentration and scales really nicely. Those summon spells that we got from Tasha's are pretty decent spells. Also, that summon spell did not require our bonus action, or our action, or anything to do what it does. It just requires our concentration. We ended up getting up to find steed and even eventually find greater steed thanks to magical secrets with that build, and that was a pretty decent damage dealer itself as well. The feign death restriction that we had on this one is ultimately what made the damage as low as it was. And yeah, it turns out that these companions who require a bonus action in order to like do anything other than take the dodge action do about the kind of damage you'd expect from a bonus action, right? So just stack 
lacking a bunch of like subpar damage dealing options still leaves us with some fairly subpar damage. All of that said, let's not underestimate the value of what's going on with this menagerie we've collected. Not only are we doing a little bit of damage with them all, potentially, but we're helping to protect our allies, potentially teleporting them away, giving flying carpet rides, slowing up our foes or speeding up our friends, and maybe most importantly of all, likely taking up precious resources and actions from our enemies as they try in vain to swat all of these stupid pets out of the way, letting our more powerful companions stay alive longer so that they can do what they need to do more effectively. And yeah, like I've said, even if the enemy does manage to get rid of these companions, they're usually pretty cheap and easy to bring back. Best of all, the build gives us a lot of fun options to be controlling and supporting really effectively while we're conscious, or play possum in a pinch while our menagerie goes buck wild. I think it would be a ton of fun to play in game, for reals. Probably more likely in a higher level one shot than a long term campaign for me, but for those of you who love playing support, I think it would work great at any level, honestly. So that's the build for the week, and I hope you enjoyed it. I had a lot of fun trying to figure out how to make this thing work. I hope you guys know how much I love you, because I do. Thank you for all that you do for me, for the channel. You're so awesome. I hope that you have a great day and a great week. And if you don't, I hope that you will hang in there. I hope that you will do good and be kind, and that I see you again very soon. But until then, take care. Bye. You fill up my senses Like a night in a forest Like a mountain in springtime Like a walk in the rain Like a storm in the desert Like a sleepy blue ocean you fill up my senses Come fill me again I love John Denver, and I'm... My niece is getting married, actually, and, uh, well, shortly after this video comes out, I think. Um, and she's asked me to perform that song at her wedding. Uh, so I need to practice. Oh, check out my shirt. Mithril Hall Brewing Company. Every time I'm uh, traveling through the frost hills in the spine of the world, always my favorite stop. This is uh, this is another awesome shirt from uh, the people over at Obvious Mimic. Check them out. Got some water on my shirt and it's like not drying. I can't record with these splotches. Dry. Come on. <laughs> <Here's> a... <laughs> Hey everybody, so here at D4, each week I do... Hmm, what do I do? Let's start that over. No, no shepherd. Yes. Yes. It's so hard. It's so hard to stay focused. <sighs> okay. And then you just gotta slowly walk it back so that they don't start focusing on shepherd. It's so hard not to focus. Okay, don't even say that. Alright. Last wrap on Drop Dead Fred.